Hey again, making another video today uh, just because I have extra free time over the winter break. So today I'll show you the Polaroid 360 and after I explain why I got it, I'll show you how everything sounds and feels. So I got this uh, pack film camera because SuperSense came out with their Kickstarter campaign film. Um, I didn't uh, order any film from that just because I figured the P7 chemistry that they were using, uh, I figured out was going to be expired. And when the, the test shots came out a while back, uh, I was right. The, the colors are all faded and uh, it's not spreading evenly, so I'll wait until they make fresh chemistry. Uh, uh, I got this one in particular, the 360, uh, because it's the model that Robert Maplethorpe started photography with. He borrowed it from Patty Smith. And uh, there are a whole bunch of variations that are pretty similar to each other. Um, I don't really know which one you should pick if there's much difference between them or anything. So why not just get the one Robert Maplethorpe started out with? Um, but yeah, so I used to have uh, a 180 back like in 2004, 2005, something like that. Uh, and I sold that after Polaroid discontinued their pack film. And they were pretty cheap back then. And then the prices spiked way up for a couple of years or something. And then they sort of came back down after Fuji discontinued FP100C. And uh, I might pick up uh, a 180 again now that the prices went down and I'm sure they'll go back up a little bit when SuperSense gets started making new uh, film. Uh, so uh, I'll keep an eye on the prices and uh, see if they start creeping up again. Uh, aside from that, the overall build quality of these pack film cameras is not that great. Um, it has a certain toy quality, toy camera quality to it, and sort of a general not not very precise level build quality to it. Um, so I wouldn't really spend a whole lot of money for one of these just because it's kind of like it's kind of a junky camera, but that's, that's part of what makes it fun. They're basically point of shoots without a whole lot of control. So they're fun cameras to use. And uh, they, I think they have potential for um, camera hacking in the future. And uh, I'll talk about that uh, after I show you the camera. So uh, there's like some interesting stuff that uh, you can do with these just because they're fun and they can give you a big uh, photo for for like a fairly somewhat sort of compact camera uh, compared to large formats so uh, like when it's unfolded the it's kind of a bulky camera and uh, but 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 it's not that heavy it's not that heavy uh, if you fold it up and then, uh, what was it? Oh, it was, am I, uh, am I doing this right? Nope. Okay. There it goes. Okay. So when you fold it up, uh, and then put on the cover and snap it. Um, it's sort of comp 
contract for sort of a large format-ish camera. And if you want to compare it to the SX70, it's only uh, it's only a little bit bigger this uh, like lengthwise, a little bit what lighter lengthwise. And yeah, it's a little bit taller just because of this bump. But the real difference is the thickness. Uh, this is quite a bit chunkier uh, that way. So um, it's a little bit, I don't know, maybe um, 60% heavier than this. I don't know. But uh, it's not quite as convenient to uh, put it in your shoulder bag and then just carry around with you. This is really more of a, you need a camera bag sort of camera. So uh, I would say a, a, this will fit in the satchel pretty nicely. Uh, so if you're taking other cameras with you on a trip or something, or um, uh, or you like use your camera bag to carry other stuff, then uh, might be you know, painlessly convenient to carry around with you. Uh, let's see. Well, I just showed you how it opens and closes. It kind of wobbles around. It's not exactly the sturdiest uh, kind of rolling camera you can get and things generally sort of creak and flex and wiggle around so it's not the sturdiest most precise camera out there but it's fun the the it's uh the the fun factor uh, that's that's what makes this sort of uh, uh, user-friendly, I don't know, appealing. That's what makes it appealing uh, compared to uh, other large format ty uh, type cameras because uh, there, it's like casual, it's hand-holdable, it's pretty portable. And so there's, there's potential there. I'll talk about that later. So uh, let's see, uh, next, the shutter button uh, is kind of wiggly and squishy and nice like that. It has the surround so you can tell when the shutter is going to uh, go off. And then the cocking lever, mm, sort of a kind of sp like a springy, wiggly spring type thing. And then when you hit the shutter, it makes a nice clack. So not super loud, but not super quiet either. Um, it's uh, kind of, it's kind of like a box camera type uh, setup inside here. So it has like a really simple shutter mechanism and uh, aperture uh, setup. So it's sort of like pretty primitive, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, compared to anything that like a startup company might be able to make these days, this is actually pretty sophisticated <laughs> comparatively. Uh, but you know, uh, next uh, the viewfinder. The um, it's actually a pretty good viewfinder. This is made by Zeiss Saigon. And it's uh, it's pretty average for a camera from the seventies. Uh, the brightness is pretty good. Uh, it has a very distinct magenta cast to it. And let's see, the focusing patch is a fuzzy edged square. 
uh, fairly big, I think, compared to the rest of the viewfinder. And the focusing, these focusing sliders, uh, they're pretty, they're pretty stiff and sort of dry feeling. It just doesn't feel that good. It might just be because something's out of whack and it's pressing against parts more than it should be. Uh, I don't really remember what my previous 180 felt like, but this doesn't feel like it's uh, exactly set up the way it should be. It's just really stiff, uh, a little hard to move with finger pressure. Um, compared, uh, the viewfinder compared to something, you know, roughly the same age. The Fuji GS645. It's the image on this is a little bit smaller, but it's basically the same brightness. So this is a pretty decent viewfinder. The eye relief is just barely enough for uh, you to see all uh, all the sides uh, without moving my eye around. So it's pretty decent. Yeah, it also uh, has parallax co correction, so it slides down to the bottom right corner when you focus closer. Uh, the top of this right focusing slide, it has um, a quick focusing scale. Uh, so when you have a 3000 ISO black and white film, you can just set it to either landscape uh, mode or groups or uh, one person portraits. Uh, I, I'll probably make a video someday about scale focusing by frame or something. I don't know what it would be called, like focus by framing or something like that, but uh, that's something people should do. Uh, more often with rangefinders. So let's see. Shutter viewfinder. Uh, the controls on the the front standard. So there's a, a lighten and darken uh, ring right here, which feels really dry and scratchy, uh, which is fine. It's, it doesn't slip around and it's easy enough to turn because it has uh, a knurled edge and this sort of hood is all wiggly and stuff and there's like a there's like a spring uh, underneath to keep it extended so yeah th this this really adds to the whole toy camera aesthetic of this. <laughs> it just springs when you, when, you, when you like poke it. So uh, let's see. Uh, here you've got the uh, film speed dial. If you just sort of turn it around with your fingertip, you're not really going to change the setting. You really have to use like the whole length of your finger to switch it. Uh, it's just a little bit too long to change it with just your fingertip, which is kind of annoying. Uh, the, the lighting selector switch here, it's pretty stiff. It's definitely not going to uh, be accidentally moved. Yeah, uh, you can see it changing from the the bright sun setting to the regular setting in there. So uh, let's see. After the front standard, there's the stuff on the back and the bottom. Uh, you've got an electronic timer that just sort of spins around fairly freely. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, is 120 seconds down to 15 seconds. And the lights are supposed to come up to show you when it's active. And it beeps when your, uh, your time's up. And let's see, on the bottom, you've got the film door switch right there. Which is uh, switch. It's not the easiest to hold on to. It's kind of too thin, I think. I wish it was a little bit grippier or something. But anyway, there you can see the insides. Uh, uh, like like uh, the Polaroid SX seventy. Uh, these uh, pack film, these automatic pack film cameras, they really show you how all the mechanics works. So uh, there's a certain Rube Goldbergian contraption-like quality to these cameras that makes them really fun. Uh, so uh, that's basically it for the camera. Uh, it's not something I would spend a lot of money on. Save that money for the film because it's really expensive. <laughs> uh, but they're really fun. And I think it would be really cool to hack these cameras. Like, uh, like you know how uh, people modify the older uh, roll film Polaroids, uh, like convert them to 4x5, or they used to convert them to pack film. I think these would be really cool to convert into shooting uh, sheet film uh, or dry plates, because J. Lane Pictoriographica, they're making dry plates now, so if someone could figure out how to make a completely new back and just take off this uh, this door right here, the film pack door, and then just make a replacement to put uh, inside uh, to like that that like closes down and fits in there, so that you could uh, put in little sleeves for dry plates or sheet film. Uh, I think that would be really cool because uh, that way you would be able to sort of uh, <laughs> save costs probably uh, compared to the Super Senses uh, single shot cartridges. It'll probably be cheaper, it'll be a really portable way to shoot large format. Um, and you would, uh, you know, have more flexibility in uh, how you print things. You can like, make enlargements or you can just keep making contact prints. Um, so I think that's one thing that uh, someone out there with the expertise, right, with the right expertise should sort of look into. Uh, another thing that I was thinking about was that uh, instead of making, of trying to recreate instant film, someone should start a company to just make a, a pack of regular film. So uh, you have a cartridge with 10 sheets of regular negative film, or, or even slide film for that matter. Uh, so make a pack that has 10, 10 shots of regular film, uh, when you pull it out, it just um, seals up that shot so it uh, stays light tight. And, and then afterwards, you take them to the dark room and you develop them like usual. Uh, I think that would be another really cool option. Uh, I would do it if I knew all the engineering and business stuff, but I don't. Uh, I kind of want to take some classes though to figure out how 
I could be, uh, <laughs> uh, sort all that stuff out, the designing, the manufacturing, the starting the business stuff. So I don't know if I'll ever actually get around to that, but someone, someone who's further along, <laughs> uh, who has the education and experience, I really hope someone does that. That would be really cool. So uh, it would it would keep these cameras uh, uh, really nice and usable in, in the future. Um, you don't have to just try to recreate instant pack film. There are other options out there. You can do dry plates and sheet film. Uh, if you convert the, the camera into those um, uh, film types. So uh, yeah, uh, overall uh, pretty fun camera. Uh, that's nice and portable and light and for the time being cheap. So uh, I guess that's it for today. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a good week.